Well, good evening. My name is Dale Janway, and this is a special WIP town hall that's being held to discuss the investigation into the radiological incident of February 14th, 2014. This town hall is being broadcast live by Red Rocket. Before we begin, I want to say a word or two about Bob McQuinn and his upcoming transfer. Bob McQuinn served as the president and general manager with NWP for approximately a year, and under his leadership, Whip made tremendous accomplishments in roof bolting, decontamination, and other elements of the recovery effort. We also appreciate his leadership with community outreach such as the NWP campaign with the United Way. The news came at approximately the same time as the news of Carlsbad field office manager Joe Franco's departure. And we are clearly very concerned by what appears to be a high administrative turnover at the federal and contractor level. We look forward to working with Mr. Breidenbach and whoever replaces Mr. Franco in getting this important facility back open. But we do consider administrative stability to be essential to the recovery process. If you will recall, there were two groups who led the primary investigation into the incident. The Accident Investigation Board and the Technical Assessment Team. CBO FO, CBFO's manager, Joe Franco, will introduce these groups and explain their roles in a moment. First, let's go ahead and welcome our special guests tonight, including Resource Protection Division Director Catherine Roberts and Dr. Martin Simon, both with the New Mexico Environment, Environmental Department, Beverly Allen and Annis with Senator Tom Udall's office, Bernadette Granger with Congressman Steve Pierce's office, and Diane Ventura with Senator Heinrich's office. We also have State Representative Catherine Brown here with us tonight. We also have a number of individuals joining us online, and as always, we thank you for your great interest in the WIP recovery process. The AIB report is the third and final report that ties in with last year's WIP incident. The first report related specifically to the February fire, and the second report was related to an investigation into what caused the radiological release to get above ground. Today's report, the one that took the most time, is about what caused the release to happen in the first place. We know this has been a long year for the AIB and TAT investigators, and we appreciate their hard work. With that, I'll now turn things over to Carlsbad Field Office Manager Joe Franco. Thank you, Mayor. Well, welcome all. Uh, <clears throat> a special uh, town hall meeting today, and uh, we wanted to make sure we got the team here uh, as we had promised. Uh, it was one of the items that we had uh, discussed before, that uh, Carlsbad as a community that's uh, supportive of the WIP project, that we would provide uh, the first briefing to the community here. And so we've done that. Uh, we thank Ted for, for uh, working a schedule so we could be first here and uh, and hope that uh, you get to ask him some questions here as he gets done. So uh, I'd like to introduce the team. The Accident Investigation Board, as the mayor stated, uh, have completed their uh, second phase of the uh, report for the rheological event. And uh, uh, Ted Weika, as he did in the previous ones, will discuss the uh, report, what's in the report. Uh, he'll talk about the uh, justifications of needs and, and the items that were identified uh, in uh, summary level and then explain how they uh, got to those results. Um, then we have, uh, so Ted will be doing all the presentation. Uh, he does have as his uh, deputy chair, uh, Roger Claiborne. Did I say that right? Claycomb. Claycomb. And uh, he's been gone for a few weeks, so I, I kind of lost track of his name. But they pretty much lived here the whole year and a couple months. So uh, Roger will be supporting uh, uh, Ted. And then we have uh, David Wilson from the Technical Assessment 
uh, team that will be uh, as a support to the AIB, but also if you have any questions for the technical assessment team, uh, David's here and John Mara is also as part of the assessment team to uh, pro at provide any answers that you may have as uh, questions on. Um, again, uh, there's a lot to present, so we'll get this kicked off. Uh, is there any, you wanna cover anything, everything? It's kind of the normal process here. We're gonna go through the presentation and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. Um, and so we uh, will go ahead and let Ted kick this off. And uh... thank you, Joe, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for thank you for hosting this uh, town hall meeting. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, and like the mayor said, it was it is long in coming. And also, a good evening to all those on the web uh, cam. Uh, that's very important. I'll just also add, we're going to do a meeting like this in Los Alamos next week. Uh, uh, the 23rd as a pub, uh, town hall meeting, which will be good because I know you, this thing was released at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so you didn't really have a chance to go through it. So that'll be an opportunity after, you know, going through it uh, to ask some questions as well, and we can do that by web. Um, I think I have been here long enough, uh, especially in the mail. I think I received my New Mexico state taxes, so I'm going to have to deal with that issue. But. Uh, but the report, as I mentioned, was issued this afternoon. Uh, it was also briefed to the secretary uh, last Tuesday. Uh, and I'm going to try to use sort of a similar type briefing that we used in that form, uh, give you guys sort of the same type of information. Uh, this briefing is on the phase two investigation of the WIP radiological event. The Accident Investigation Board has been on the ground since uh, February 9th of 2014, so that's about 13 months we were actually on the ground. Uh, the board issued two reports. I think you've had it, and I briefed you on both of those, the salt truck fire, as well as the uh, phase one for the radiological event. And both of those are online. Um, we had a very experienced uh, board. I was blessed with that. A lot of great board members, a lot of great experience besides Roger, and a whole host of subject matter advisors. Uh, by the dozens, they came in whenever we needed them. Uh, in terms of ventilation system, RADCON, radiological protection, you name it, we've had advisors and support from across the complex. It was a, a real team effort. And, and as well as with the technical assistance team, we were fortunate enough to have uh, under David Le David, David's leadership, as well as John Murrah, we worked very, you know, we sort of had an independent role, but we were also worked very closely with each other, you know, to make sure that we got it right, because we knew this was very important uh, for the WIP recovery and for this community as well as Los Alamos. Also like to note that uh, we could have not have succeeded in this uh, without the site leadership, uh, both here as well as at Los Alamos. And I really want to recognize Joe Franco and Bob McQuinn. Uh, I, and I've been on both sides of these type of investigations. They're not easy and they're even more difficult to uh, you know, listen to me on the receiving end. But it really takes a uh, leadership uh, from uh, Joe and Bob to really make this successful because we had to get a lot of information. We had to do a lot of interviews, look at a lot of objective evidence, and both of them as senior leaders know it's, it's not about just uh, this event, it's a big lessons learned piece for the rest of the department. And in order to do that, you have to get to the information. I also want to thank the, the mayor and the city leadership. Uh, you know, it did take longer than uh, I think we all want it. Uh, and you have been a tremendous support uh, for the investigative process. And I think, and I hope you expect, uh, expect to you know, find that the report is thorough and uh, a quality product uh, and is you know, needed not only for recovery here, but for everybody to sort of look at themselves in a the rear view mirror. Uh, because it's, this isn't just about kitty litter, it's not just about drums, it's about, as, as we'll go through the slides, you know, a breakdown in processes, systems, procedures, oversight activities, which, absolutely. Thank you very much. Let me go to the first slide. Um, the phase one, the radiological release event was investigated in two phases. Phase one focused on the release of radioactive material from the underground to the environment. Phase two, this report focuses on the release from the breech drum. And I can say with high confidence, one breech drum. And as we go through the presentation, I'll hopefully convince you of that. Now the board determined in phase one that the cumulative effect of inadequacies in the ventilation system design 
as well as a nuclear safety classification of the ventilation system and operability, compounded by degradation and key safety management programs and safety culture, resulted in a release of radioactive material to the environment. And it also delayed uh, the, and uh, made it ineffective the response to the release. Now, the phase one report was issued about a year ago, April 22nd, 2014. It was important to do that, and we did that with uh, Joe's leadership and Bob's leadership, you know, because these were the conclusions as in the judgment of needs that we found our findings were absolutely critical for the recovery effort in all phases. Phase one report, as you recall, when I briefed this, identified ineffective programs at WIP in the areas sort of listed there in the yellow box, and those are important systems, uh, you know, nuclear safety, emergency management, conduct of operations, maintenance, radiation protection, safety culture, uh, and oversight at all levels. Now this was sort of a, we had a unique experience in, with this board because we were here for a long period of time, 13 months. One thing that we have noticed is a, a great, um, immense amount of improvement in a lot of these areas. Uh, you know, and I'll just pick on rad radiation protection. Uh, you know, 13 months ago we needed help from Los Alamos and, and Savannah River. You know, now I think these folks here, the workforce is probably up to par with the rest of the complex. And I could probably say the same thing in a lot of those areas. Uh, so a lot of improvements over the last year. And this report also, uh, you, the way you're going to need to read it, uh, phase two, it only includes the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, the phase one stuff, the stuff uh, from the previous report is not injected into phase two. So really, the, you have to read both volumes to get the complete story for the radiological release event. This slide is a board purpose and scope. Uh, it's very really simple. Determine what happened, why it happened, and how to prevent it. And we looked at program systems, processes, procedures, as well as the forensics. What it's not, it's not intended or seek to fix blame. We're not looking for the individuals. That's not that important. What it is is a very disciplined process resulting in a formal report. Just like the last two reports and last two efforts, I directed the team at the beginning to refrain from doing any analysis prior to completing the data gathering phase. And that's really important with the high achievers that we had on the team. It's easy. They want to connect the dots and get into the analysis and judgment of needs. But you really, you need to take the time, and that's why it takes time to do these things, to get the evidence, get the, you know, get the interviews done, and get everything on the table so that we can do the analysis. Also important to note that all the statements were transcribed using court reporters at both locations, uh, here in Carlsbad as well as at Los Alamos. So we have about 2,000 pages of transcribed testimony. Um, and we also did an extensive factual accuracy review. Uh, was conducted both here as well as at Los Alamos, and this was by the federal force as well as the contractor force. So we had rooms full of people looking at this document. We did think things a little bit differently. Now, most acts of investigation should black out everything except for the facts. We actually provided the entire document, you know, the analysis, the conclusions, the judgment of needs, and got really good information from it. So uh, at least from their perspective, there shouldn't be anything new in this report or anything that I brief, and I think that's probably the case. Another key point, and this is really important in the process, is that every causal factor, every conclusion, every judgment of need is something that is discussed, a lot of discussion, and agreed to by all five board members. And it's something that we also have multiple uh, facts uh, uh, confirmed by multiple sources. So all the facts are confirmed by multiple sources. We have a lot of information in which we had just one piece of one data coming in, and we're not using that. Uh, you know, it has to be collaborated with uh, other uh, pieces of information, which is really important uh, for the process. Let me start with this slide. Uh, this is the first uh, substantive slide at, uh, to direct and root cause. Interesting about this, this is the last slide that we ever, last piece of information that we ever developed after we go through the months of the investigation and the analysis and we had, we actually had the 400 pages written. Then we talk about was it, was it preventable? And what are the, the causes, the direct cause as well as the root causes? The board determined that the accident was preventable. Uh, direct cause, it was an exothermic reaction of incompatible materials in Lano Waste Drum 68660, which resulted in overpressurization of the drum, a breach of the drum, and then a release of a portion of the drum's contents into the WIP underground. 
And that's pretty consistent with uh, the direct cause that the uh, technical assessment team came up with as well. We have two root causes, a local root cause as well as a systemic root cause. Typically in accident investigations, you only have one root cause, but we went ahead and broke it up into a local as well as systemic. Board identified the local root cause as the failure of lands to understand and effectively implement the land hazardous waste facility permit and the calls bed field office director controls or the director controls from the national troop program which i'll give a couple of examples specifically the uh, Lano's use of organic wheat based absorbent instead of the required inorganic absorbent such as kitty litter zeolite clay for nitrate salts resulted in a generation shipment and in, and in placement of a non-compliant ignitable waste form in terms of the systemic root cause Board identified that as the Los Alamos field office, as well as the National Troop Program, failure to ensure that Lano had adequately developed and implemented repackaging and treatment procedures that incorporated suitable hazard controls and included a rigorous review and approval process. Specifically, Los Alamos field office and the National Troop Program did not ensure the adequate flow down of RECRA and other upper tier requirements into the operating procedures at Lano. These are the deck plate procedures, procedures used in the glove box. Uh, examples of these upper tier requirements include the WIP, uh, WAP, which is the waste analysis plan, that's an appendix to the permit, as well as the uh, waste acceptance criteria, as well as key elements for both permits, the Lano and the uh, WIP uh, hazard of, of permits. Some examples include unclear oversight and program management roles and responsibilities. Others include not maintaining the ad, ad, uh, accuracy of the waste stream documentation or the acceptable knowledge, and not managing absorption and neutralization as permit required treatment processes. Again, the specifics as we go through these. Next slide, this is uh, areas of contributing causes. These aren't the contributing causes, these are the areas where the board identified contributing causes. Probably most of you know contributing causes or events or conditions that collectively, with other causes, increase the likelihood or severity of the event, but that individually did not cause the event. I sort of look at these as sort of missed opportunities. This is probably the second last thing we came up with. The contributing causes were developed from the investigative facts and an analysis and led to the board conclusions and judgment of needs or findings. Some, as you can tell, are specific to WIP Others are specific to uh, Los Alamos. They range from programmatic system work controls to oversight at all levels. And I'll discuss these in some of the other slides. I'm also going to discuss the uh, forensic basis for the direct cause, for the Accident Investigation Board's direct cause. And this is an important point. Even though the forensics may be the more interesting piece, you know, with the chemistry, the exothermic reaction, exactly what's happening within the drum, and it is, it's the contributing causes that establish the conditions in the environment for this exothermic reaction to take place. And in other words, it's less about the kitty litter and more about the failures in these areas of contributing causes that we can learn from. Let me start off, and I'm, these are in no order of importance. I just sort of think, as well as the board, we look from the high-level program piece down to deck plate procedures, and so this is how I'm sort of briefing it. But in the area of the National Troop Program, the board determined the contributing cause to be the failure of Los Alamos Field Office and the National Troop Program to ensure that the lands and the Central Characterization Program, or CCP, complied with the record requirements in the WIP and Lano hazardous waste facility permits, as well as the WIP waste acceptance criteria. In the yellow box, you'll see on a couple of these slides, these, if you're not uh, aware of, uh, of the National Troop Program or some of these other pieces, I, we try to keep, uh, put a couple of bullets there to help explain what they are. Examples in this uh, contributing cause include uh, unapproved treatment, such as neutralization of liquids, absorption with an organic material, and the addition of incompatible secondary waste items. Now, the board made several conclusions, some of them in this area, as the board concluded, that the National Troop Program oversight activities associated with the characterization and certification of the true waste were ineffective in identifying programmatic weaknesses through the execution of certification audits 
and surveillances at Los Alamos. Certification audit process failed to include key elements of Delano waste activities such as the specific glove box treatment and repackaging operations. In other words, things that happen across the boundary lap fence line at the generator site activities. The audits and surveys uh, did not adequately consider and or evaluate the impact of these activities on the characterization and certification of the waste. Additionally, the board found that there were missed opportunities in the certification audit process to identify inconsistencies between the CBFO director controls or the National True Program director controls, the land's directed procedure changes based on the program director controls, as well as the Wicker glove box procedure, basically connecting the dots between the program direction and what's happening actually in the glove box. The board found that this was more remarkable given that the use of organic absorbent with nitrate salts was a focus area dating back several years. This is not a new issue, it's about 2010. In 2012, in fact, the CBFO directed the use of inorganic absorbent with nitrate salts following re extensive and uh, research done by New Mexico Tech as well as a local LANO office in Carlsbad. And this, they were addressing organic uh, absorbents. However, this direction from the, from the National True Program provided in 2012 did not correctly or adequately flow down to the subcontractor. Now, all layers of oversight, including the National True Program audits and surveys, failed to identify that the incorrect absorbent was one that was specified in the glove box procedure. And secondly, that it was being used actually with nitrate salts, recognizing that this was an established and you know, a recognized problem area. Now, as a partial explanation, the board concluded that the roles, responsibilities, and expectations as documented in the National True Program policies and procedures appeared to limit the ability of the National True Program to analyze and assess the generator site waste activities. Even the ability to determine if such activities impacted the certification and characterization of the waste. Now, the, we looked hard at this. The board believes this is probably a little bit more perception than reality based on our review of the flow down of documents from the CFR to the permit to the waste analysis plan and into the governing and into the local directives. Therefore, and I'm not going to go over too many John's uh, judgment of needs or findings, but this is one area in which the board developed a judgment of need for headquarters to review and then clarify the national troop program policies and expectations with regard to fully understanding the impact of the generator site waste activities on the certification and characterization of the waste. Also, not just so much in this area and the other areas as well, we de uh, developed several extent of condition reviews, which you'll see in the, in the report. And this is to assess the conclusions from a programmatic perspective rather than just focusing on the event and on one and on the lab, on the Los Alamos, but look at it from a programmatic perspective. Let me go to the next area, next area of uh, where we have a contributing cause. A contributing cause is a failure of CCP to develop an acceptable knowledge for the Minnow 2 waste stream that adequ adequately captured all available information regarding the waste generation and subsequent repackaging activities. Again, sort of the definition of CCP, CCP are sort of the bullets there in the yellow box to help you. Need to know, first of all, an acceptable knowledge. Acceptable knowledge is sort of a compendium of information about the waste stream. It's a very important uh, set of documents. It describes the site history, the mission, the operations, in addition to the waste stream specific information used to define the generating processes, the waste matrix, the waste quantities, and contaminants, both the radiological and chemical. So specifically in this case, uh, the board found that the central characterization program did not ensure that the acceptable knowledge summary report accurately represented the Minnow 2 waste stream to prevent the shipment of corrosive, ignitable, or reactive waste. The acceptable knowledge summary report did not capture many of the changes made to the Wicker glove box procedure. Wicker is the facility at Los Alamos where they do their repackaging. Uh, now this procedure, the glove box procedure, is the principal and the primary procedure for repackaging true waste drums at Los Alamos. Now, as an example, between May 2007 and March 2013, there were 37 revisions to the Wicker glove box procedure. And these are major changes. These are changes adding absorbent, 
change in the absorbent, change in the ratio of absorbent based on the amount of nitrate salts and liquid, adding neutralizing agent, change in neutralizing agent. So these were not just administrative changes, these were significant, significant technical changes. None of these were really reviewed or effectively reviewed by CCP or by the acceptable knowledge or subject matter experts that would understand the impact of these changes on the characterization and certification of the activities. So as a result, many of the changes were not really reflected in the acceptable knowledge. Therefore, the acceptable knowledge was not as useful as we think in identifying the impact of these changes on the characterization and certification of the waste. Now, the accuracy of the acceptable knowledge is particularly important for this waste stream. It's important for all the waste streams, but it's particularly important for this waste stream because of the limited ability of the supporting characterization methods such as the real-time radiography and visual examination. Neither method can effectively or readily distinguish from, uh, between organic and inorganic material. You can't see that, distinguish those things with an RTR or real-time radiography. And, and it's hard to even do that visually with a visual examination. We didn't do visual examinations on this waste stream. So this highlights the importance of keeping the acceptable knowledge accurate and relevant, but it was not adequately maintained for this waste stream. Let me address a couple, here are a couple of contributing causes and these are specific to Los Alamos. One area in the area of hazard identification and controls, board determined and contributing cause to be the failure of lands to develop and implement adequate processes for hazard identification and controls. Board concluded that the execution of the lands job hazard analysis was ineffective in identifying the hazard created by the addition of organic absorbent with the nitrate salt waste. And we looked at the complete job hazard analysis program up there. There were problems in the analytical process uh, and within the procedure as well as even making sure that you have the right skill mixture involved in the analysis. Board also concluded that the lands did not adequately evaluate the impact of the WIP waste acceptance criteria or effectively control the addition of secondary job waste into the true waste containers. Specifically, the wicker glove box procedure contained no specific direction to dispose of secondary waste items such as gloves, neutralizer containers, even though these were routinely placed into daughter drums. What happens in the glove box is you have other things, other debris that you put into the daughter drums. You might have some plastics, you may have some rubber gloves, you may have some empty bottles of neutralizing agents, and all of that was typically and routinely placed into the daughter drums but there's no technical evaluation on if, there's, if these are incompatible materials as these items are put into the drums, uh, nor, are they, uh, nor is it sp uh, specified in the procedure what type of things should be in there, what type of things shouldn't be in there, or how do you look at incompatibility. Second issue up there, uh, second area, is the lands procedures and safety programs. Uh, board determined the contributing cause to be the failure of lands to implement effective processes for procedure development, review, and change control. Lands failed to ensure that there were sufficient detail provided in the wicker glove box procedure to ensure safe, consistent, and compliant repackaging of the waste. Procedure lacked details on neutralization, including a document and hazard analysis on the chemicals used or a change in the chemicals, chemicals are they used. Additionally, until revision 37, which was March 2013, the glove box procedure did not specify any neutralization process. Uh, pH was measured, neutralization occurred outside the procedure, and then the liquid was absorbed. So the, uh, the uh, procedure at that point until March 2013 was even just silent on the use of neutralizing aging. Board also concluded that the wicker glove box procedure was not adequately developed such that it not, did not contain detailed information for accurately documenting and recording the contents of the waste drums. Specifically, the glove box procedure did not require operators to document critical process steps such as initial pH, absorbent edit, neutralizer used, and adjusted pH. And I know on behalf of the Accident Investigation Board and the same with the technical assessment team, you know, we found it in terms of trying to identify what are those sensitive drums that we should be looking at. 
Uh, and we were looking first at those that had, you know, pair drums where they had some uh, a free liquid in a lower pH. But out of the 21, that, uh, those drums within the panel seven, six of them only had recorded pH. The other ones were silent. They, so it's a lack of documentation uh, by the operators. It's not an operator issue. It's what's prescribed, what's required in a procedure for them to document these important things that's needed to, you know, look at, uh, you know, look at the drums. The board also concluded that lands failed to provide sound technical basis for decisions regarding repackaging procedures and processes for the minnow through waste stream. There was no evidence that any type of technical evaluation regarding the compatibility of the absorbent, including adjustments of the ratio of absorbent used based on the amount of nitrate salts and liquid present. Again, a, uh, a lack of technical evaluation for changes, important changes. I'm not going to go through all of the contributing causes. It's, you know, there's a 400 page document, there's a chapter on each. I'm going to hit, you know, these and then get into some of the forensics. Uh, but I wanted to uh, briefly discuss at least the contributing causes in the area of oversight and safety culture. Specifically, the failure of the land's contractor assurance system, the Los Alamos field office and headquarters to conduct oversight, adequate oversight were identified as contributing causes by the Accident Investigation Board. For the, for the Lands Contractor Assurance System, this is one that we looked hard. We looked at their program and we did a spot check on a lot of their surveillances and audits. The cast did not ensure the adequate depth and breadth of the management self-assessments, independent assessments, and management assessments. Nor did the cast identify inadequacies in the procedure development or ensure rigor in the implementation of the change control process. Looking at the Los Alamos field office, the federal, site, uh, federal oversight activities were ineffective in identifying weaknesses in the execution of waste packaging, characterization, and certification. Additionally, operational oversight was limited to the facility representatives with a lack of support from appropriate subject matter experts in area of waste management or CCP. And this is probably something for us all to learn from across the complex. And it's nothing about the fa facility representatives. Uh, like here, those folks there are the best in the complex uh, and a lot of great skill on both sides. Uh, uh, but facility representatives are folks that go out and look for things, they smell things, they hear things. If there's problems, then they go to a subject matter expert on their staff to drill down on. Uh, and this is a case where on this staff, you, you really weren't uh, staff with the expertise in CCP, AK, acceptable knowledge, or waste packaging. Uh, not that in it, we're in budget constraints environment, just like here at WIP and same at Los Alamos and the other sites. It's not where we can throw FTEs and move people around and add maybe additional members to the staff, but it's, it's where we're going to have to sort of leverage our resources across the complex. If we need help on a certain area, there's people within the complex that sh they should be able to call upon to help them address those questions. We're changing the absorbent. We're doing something with the neutralizing agent to give the facility representatives that support. Let's keep, we need to keep close to the mic. Uh, okay, sounds good. Now for the uh, federal management and oversight, uh, and this is headquarters, the board identified minimal external national program operational performance oversight especially in the overlap areas uh, between the waste generation, certification, and disposal. And this includes from EM headquarters, uh, as well as independent office of oversight. Uh, really didn't look, you know, there were pieces that, uh, you know, uh, they looked at in turn EM headquarters, as well as independent oversight, you know, on like transportation, the facilities, on fire protection, but not a, a nuts to bolts review of the National Troop Program, you know, that's lacking. Uh, and most of the oversight was based on budget and financial oversight rather than looking at operation oversight. So we have a few, we have several conclusions and judgment of needs on the adequacy of uh, federal uh, headquarters oversight as well. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Now for safety culture and stop work, this is an important piece as well. Uh, it was evidence that within uh, pockets of the organizations that workers did not feel comfortable identifying issues that may adversely affect management direction, delay mission-related objectives, 
or otherwise uh, affect cost of schedule. Now it's important to note that we did not do a uh, safety culture investigation. You know, we were investigating an event and these things came to our attention through our investigation efforts. Uh, so it, we looked at a small piece of it, but we found you know, attributes of some safety culture concern. Additionally, some workers reported to the board that the first level supervisors failed to address work or worker control, uh, concerns regarding unexpected conditions or reactions during waste repackaging. What that means is in the glove box, when the uh, workers were repackaging some of the drums, they saw some things happen. You know, they saw a little bit of foaming action on occasions. They saw some reactions, a little bit of, you know, I think it was green smoke or dot, blood, yellowish. Uh, and, they, and they sort of reported to the first level supervisors and, and you know, they had a short discussion and back on the assembly line, back working again. Uh, now that information did not make its way up to lands and, and we pulled the string all the way up and went through interviews as well as to DOE and it, it wasn't an issue of malice or it was more of an issue of just not understanding at both a, a worker level as well as the first level supervisor level at the subcontractor the issue, the, the reactions that they're working with, you know, the hazards involved and the controls. But that came through several interviews. This is sort of the scorecard of the judgment of needs. I won't go through this in detail. It's for those who like numbers. These are the, again, the areas of contributing causes, the conclusions. I think there's, tw there's 24, uh, 40 judgment of needs, and that sort of shows a distribution of the owners of their respective findings or judgment of needs. And you're probably looking at those numbers now and saying, hey, they don't add up. Some of them don't. That's because some of the uh, judgment of needs have multiple owners. But that's sort of the scorecard for it. Let me shift gears a little bit and I'll go through um, the forensics. Now the board established solid technical and investigate a basis for the direct cause. The event initiated in drum 68660, and I can say that with most certainty. This is based on forensics from visual, extensive visual surveillance, chemical and radiological sampling, modeling. We had significant modeling efforts, including by the University of uh, Maryland staff in uh, 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 air circulation modeling and fire modeling as well as source, uh, source term calculations. Now the radiological and chemical analysis were worked closely with the technical assessment team, but there was some independence. We, you know, we looked at the same data and we did our independent analysis and we also did independent modeling and source term calculations. The AIB led and directed all visual surveillance and sampling activities in the underground. You know, I think I, I was down there for every time a picture was taken or a sample was taken within the last, last 13 months. And so we directed where the pictures should be taken and what samples we needed to come up with our direct cause. Now the visual surveillance was conducted in two phases, uh, using a dome camera as well as a dipping camera. Dome camera was used uh, for the surveillance above the array. It was sort of like a football arena camera. Uh, and then the Accident Investigation Board actually provided the specifications for that camera. H very high resolution, uh, able to adjust the lighting, uh, pan tilt capability, 360 degree ca capability, so it worked very well. Then we also had a dipping camera that we used between the seams. And I'll show you a couple of pictures, but we were able to get into the smallest of holes to view, view all levels of the targeted inner areas. So within the array, you had, you usually, we had there's 64 stacks. In each stack, there may be you know, a three to two components that you have to look at, depending upon if it's a 10 drum overpack, which takes up two places. We were able to get to each level, each stack, on all four sides of all the places that we needed to get to, and uh, especially using that dipping camera. And we also and we did that to you know, look at the integrity of the locking rings, look at the integrity of packages, as well as, as, well as container seals. Now the targeted areas were based on what we observed uh, using the dome camera, you know, if we saw places of heat impact, we put that on our target list. As well as, you know, several months waiting for the reach to be developed, we looked at drum history, looked at the isotopic ratios and free liquid and pH of the parent drums and tried to identify where were those places that we needed to put this dipping camera. Where did we need to do a 100% visual surveillance? Now the key takeaways in this effort is that the board conducted 
a systematic and comprehensive inspection at ERA. We assembled experts from across the complex to help us with the analysis of the pictures. In fact, we had folks from the labs, national labs, from the sites, from the field offices, uh, and from the technical assessment team. What we really did was anybody that would be reviewing those pictures when we did the first go around in our respective organizations, we got them in one room. And they were working for the Accident Investigation Board. And it was, it was a good process because a lot of those folk, folks came in with different perspectives. There's multiple drums, there's other things going on. It couldn't be one drum. So we really were able to you know, bring collectively the group together to look at this. And like I mentioned, there's 64 stacks in the array. Each stack took 10, 20 hours of analysis time. So that's a lot of time. Uh, and that's after we got the pictures in the room uh, with you know, a room full of people with monitors, each stack took about you know, 10 to 20 hours to do a full analysis on. In fact, the analysis is documented in a, it's, this is a, I didn't want to make an appendix because it's a 670 page document, but it is a reference document uh, based on the visual surveillance using the uh, REACH equipment. And it will be available to the public, all the references. I think we had 23 boxes of references, and I know that Tad has a bunch of them too. Those are all going to be uh, posted as soon as possible on the OSTI webpage. Uh, the other key point in this is that the board does not need, and nor does it desire, one additional picture or sample to make our direct cause. And I think that's the, and that's the same with, of course, the Tad. Let me go through this picture. This is sort of a neat picture. You might, some of you may have seen it. This is a picture that illustrates the uh, physical arrangement of the uh, reach beam used during the visual surveillance. I can figure out how you. The top two pictures here, you're looking towards the bulkhead, which is about 90 feet back. And uh, the back picture is actually from the bulkhead, looking at I can, one of us there with our headlamps on. So we're looking from the bulkhead back to the waste face. And as you can tell, the beam clearance, uh, we were a little concerned at first to make sure we had enough space, but we had about two to three inches there to put the caddy up there. And that's the caddy sort of rides on that beam to get the pictures, both the uh, uh, dome camera as well as the dipping camera. Important thing on this though, notice the shape of the MGO stacks, the MGO piles on the containers, as well as the angle of repos of the MGO uh, 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 stacks. You know, they sort of conform to the packages under the MGO. They're square if they're under a standard waste box, and they sort of had that cone shape if they're above a, a seven pack or a three pack. So what this does tell us, it tells us something now. It tells us that there's no evidence of any sort of pressure or detonation event. It's purely a thermal type event. This is my favorite picture, and I, I really need to hall, hallmark this. It's a, I can't say it enough, uh, the workers at this site are a tremendous asset, and this, these are just eight of them, but there's a, you know, everybody's doing a great job out there. It takes a big team to make this happen. Uh, for us to do what we did, but they're doing it every day with ground control, with all the other activities that they're doing. They're a very skilled workforce, and I got to spend four weeks with them underground in one of those, uh, you know, in one, in one of those uh, you know, set of PPEs. Uh, they did an amazing job, uh, just to give you sort of appreciation of what they did. You know, all this equipment came in in two semi trucks, you know, to the site. In the workforce, those the, eight, the uh, team of eight down there actually got it down underground, probably about a mile to the waste face, with a scissor lift, some uh, carts, and by hand. And they also, you know, they, they hooked up the entire assembly. And this is when you have like three sets of gloves and, you know, re paper or respirator on and two layers, and you're getting hot and stuff. You know, they hooked up all this stuff, and you're talking with washers and bolts and nuts and, you know, putting everything together, tons of cabling, as well as, well as operating the system for four weeks. And it was done uh, with no contamination and uh, no injuries. And that is a big deal, you know, to do that type of work, uh, you know, in those conditions without any injuries. So you should be proud of the team. I know you guys are, you know, proud of the workforce here, very exceptional group of people. And it's not just them. It's, you know, all the support. Uh, activities, you know, to make it happen. Okay, I'll talk about the inspection results and I'll try to do it in certain quadrants. 
Uh, I mean, just to put you, give you a perspective, this is sort of the way space. This is where you're standing, or where we were, where we were, where we were standing for most of the time. And you have two 90 degree turns here, and so this is sort of the way space. And so I'm going to talk about the stub in the red box. Talk about this, uh, and this is the bulkhead back here, about 90 feet back. And I'll talk about the uh, packages in the yellow boxes as well as the back and ribs, and then talk about the areas of interest here that are circled in uh, purple. But again, I'm just going to go through a handful full of slides so I don't take up the entire evening and tomorrow. Uh, the rest of it's in the 670-page uh, report that takes you through a array uh, by uh, a package by package sort of analysis. First is a waste face, uh, that's rows 19 to uh, 24. Again, that's sort of where we're standing, closest face to us. They're, those are clean, no, uh, no damage. Uh, waste containers, MGO sacks look good, and emplacement materials, and I can tell you definitively there's no damage here. I've been down there for the last 11 months. Uh, it's clean, but we did get the camera into all those uh, areas in between the different drums just to make sure there wasn't something that we did not see. We did that with the aerial camera as well as with the dipping camera. Now the backs and ribs, uh, those look pretty good too. Uh, you sort of see a picture there of the north rib and then you sort of see the back and those are just still pictures but we took that camera and looked at all pieces, all areas of the back as well as the rib. The only damage that we saw was on the south rib and a couple of areas and that was where we had MGO bags, and these are polypropylene uh, type fabric, and they also have uh, sort of a uh, cardboard stiffener inside. So when those things bur burnt or melt, they sort of moved over, you know, sort of collapsed over to the rib, and that's sort of where we sort of saw some of the scorching on the south rib was as a result of the MGO polypropylene as well as the uh, uh, fiberboard inside. Okay, looking at the area farthest from the array, those are just, the, the, the pictures are the yellow dots there. And we have a lot of pictures also on the other side just to show that we actually did get the 90 feet and saw the other side of the bulkhead. Uh, but as you can tell from no pack or whether it's a seven pack, and then you have a slip sheet down here. What that means when I'm talking polypropylene and polyethylene is combustible materials. You're looking at heat flux. You're looking at the amount of heat in a time uh, you know, that those packages or that material has to see that heat. And they have different melting temperatures and burning temperatures, and the polyethylene is a, just a little bit less than the polypropylene, but both of them are re relatively, uh, uh, you know, at low numbers. This is, uh, this is 1775, uh, and this is this package here. You have a standard waste box on an SLB2. And this is important because this is the furthest away where we saw any sort of damage in the array. And you can sort of see it here, right here. This is an SWB, which contain uh, uh, four drums or contain other materials, over an SLB2, a very large container. That was sort of the fire barrier, as you can tell, within this event. You really don't have a lot of combustible material. The only thing you have is a fiberboard uh, slip sheet there. And you can sort of see a little burn here, a little bit sort of charring from the, the fiberboard. That probably happened as a result of ember flow, as well as direct propagation from the MGO bag, uh, which is right here, could have popped over and uh, you know, burnt that piece. But that's a very minor part of damage, and that was, again, the furthest damage in the array where we sort of saw any evidence of any burning. Let me get to this one. This is sort of interesting, 18.6. This is where it's located. Again, this is a waste face. This is where we're standing. The breech drum is right here. And this damage here is actually on uh, this face right here. So it's, you know, we put the camera all around uh, this package at all three levels. Actually, it looks pristine on this side. You can sort of see the shrink wrap right there, the little bit, as well as on this side. You can sort of see the reinforcing plate, the polyethylene reinforcing plate. This is where you have the damage. This thing should go like this all the way around. And then you have the slip sheet. Around the other sides, it, it looks pristine. You know, the shrink wrap, the reinforcing plate, the, uh, the polyethylene material. You, you do have an MGO bag that burnt there. So the propagation here is, are, it was probably either from the, poly pro, uh, poly, uh, the MGO bag falling here. And you can sort of see this, this is that uh, cardboard inside the MGO bag. 
the polypropylene bag. This is a sample of a cardboard that sort of fell out when it burned. The other thing that might be happening here, and uh, so we learned a lot from the REACH process was sort of propagation mechanisms, and we're, uh, we're interested really in the, uh, in the ember flow, because you had a lot of stuff flowing up, you know, from the breech drum. And uh, don't forget, you had a lot of ventilation going through there in a the ventilation mode, in a maintenance ventilation mode that we were in at the time of the event, by about 30,000 cubic feet per minute of airflow. Of course, it's going through 390 degree turns, and you know you have a lot of weird eddy currents, vortexes. It's not a laminar flow. Uh, and then when you shift to maintenance mode, I mean to filtration mode, which happens during the event, it goes down to about 3,000 uh, cubic feet per minute. But what you also have is a good back search there. And, 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 and that's where we saw a lot of contaminants in front of the waste face and even upstream in um, panel seven. So this is probably where we had embers flowing and you know, because of the change in the back burst and the ventilation flow, you know, it landed here. You know, probably burnt this off uh, a reinforcing plate and then the shrink wrap around it. And that was the only place in that piece where we sort of saw damage. Again, the rest, the rest of the stuff is pretty clean. Let me go through sort of the damage in rows nine and 10 that sort of illustrate it with the yellow circle. This, this is important too, we learned a lot uh, because when we initially did the first surveillance back in the early summer, we were very limited by this, the pole that we were using, basically getting maybe at the most 40, 45 feet. At that point, we were only able to see the middle two drums, you know, because the other drums from the other sites, Idaho and Savannah River, were further back. Uh, but this is representative, what you're seeing here, of the damage that we saw around all the drum packages, whether they're minnow two drums, whether they're Idaho drums, or whether they're Savannah River drums. Uh, and as you can tell, all the combustible loading material, the polyethylene slip sheet, the shrink wrap, the reinforcing plate, that's all gone. And we saw that you know, at all three levels, wherever we had drums. Now there was very little damage, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of pictures, even in the, uh, even in the ground zero where this happened, you know, for some of the packages that, uh, that don't have a lot of combustible loading material, like the 10 pack of under drums and the standard waste boxes, those look, those look pretty clean, even in the uh, high impact area. Now we looked closely at all these drums, you know, because as you can tell, those look pretty uh, damaged there, you know, from at least a view from this angle. And we got the camera on all four sides, got it inches to the uh, locking ring just to confirm the integrity of the drums in the seals. Uh, and, and we were able to do that. And we looked all at, you know, at all, four, all, of, uh, all four sides. And we also looked at the adje uh, uh, adjacent packages. Because one thing you can do with visual, you can sort of see if a lid pop, you can see if there's a breach, you can see if there's bulging, you can see if there's a lot of ejected material if you see some sort of spray on the adjacent material. You may not be able to see if there's a very, very, very minor amount of spray. But we're, you know, we, we're, we're uh, confident that you know, with all these drums that we went to look at, you know, at all three levels, that the, they were in, uh, the uh, locking rings were in uh, integrity, as well as the seals. This, this last drum down here, this is sort of an interesting one, uh, and we saw this throughout the array. Uh, what's, what you're looking at here is the polyethylene uh, uh, reinforcing plate. It melted, it puddled, solidified, then it cracked. And you, you saw this phenomenon sort of uh, throughout the array. And one thing to note there sort of got us a little excited initially when we took a look at this drum. You don't see a vent there. We thought, oh goodness, what happened to that vent? Uh, we, then we finally, about 10 minutes later, got the camera down to the side and found out it was a Savannah River dunnage drum. And so dunnage drums don't have vents on them. Let me talk about rows 14 and 15. Uh, this was the high impact area. This is ground zero. And we really uh, obtained a lot of good information from this. 16-4, uh, you can sort of see that's the breech drum and that's the drum itself. Uh, there's one seven pack, and seven pack means a seven pack of uh, 55 gallon drums on top of a 10 drum overpack. Uh, the 15.5, uh, right above it, is a one standard waste box on two seven pack assemblies. Again, two seven pack of uh, 55 gallon drums. 
or 16 and 16.6 uh, and 17.5 or standard waste boxes on top of a 10 drum overpack. The reason why this is important is, uh, even though this is ground zero, there's a very limited amount of damage, a lot less than expected. Uh, and we went in thinking there was another drum of interest in 15.5. Uh, we thought for sure we'd see something. Most of the analysis team thought so as well. But when we got the camera down there, it actually, you know, actually looked very clean. In fact, this, just to show you what we did, this is a guide tube. This is not here, it's actually on the other side of 15.5. It's a real small hole, about six inches. And we took the two inch camera and got it in there and that's between the shrink wrap so we were actually able to see the middle drum of 15.5 by putting the camera through that little hole uh, to confirm you know, that there was any damage. And, and, and you'll see in a couple of other pictures where you, uh, because of the, wherever we really found the drums, you know, that's where you sort of saw the damage from the heat impact, where you have uh, containers with not a lot of combustible loading, such, such as a 10 drum overpack or the standard waste boxes, you didn't see that much damage. Okay, this is the breech drum, and uh, you sort of see that blue heat pattern, which is a, evident from the exothermic reaction. This heat pattern sort of aligns with the lower part of the mid region, which is where the most likely location of the absorbed liquid. This drum, uh, you probably already know this, you know, is about 67% filled. The top part contained mainly air, nothing up there. Then the middle part contained kitty litter, the nitrate salts, the nitric acid, and the neutralizing material. And then the bottom layer is what uh, contained the trash, the glove, and the rubber plastics. And, so this is pretty much where it lined up with that lower portion of the middle area. So where, where it, especially the absorbed liquid. This is also a good slide, as you can see, this is a ground zero, look at this, this is that 10 drum overpack. You can sort of see that looks pretty clean, pretty white there. And same thing, same thing here, you can sort of see, you know, the pack of 10 drum overpack, this is a little bit harder to see, but that looks pretty clean too. And that's where the hottest area, you know, the event happened. Let me go to sort of the summary page for us is uh, the event initiated in 16.4, drum 68660. We ruled out uh, initiation in 15.5, and we ruled out initiation in any other place in the array. Now, the greatest damage uh, was the areas where there was most combustible materials. In fact, we did a combustible um, um, uh, map loading before we even, you know, months before we even got underground. Uh, and, and we lined that up with at the, the, you know, the, the final picture of where we had damage and they were almost a one for one match. It was really interesting. And this also process demonstrates the importance of ember flow as well as the use of combustible material and that's something we'll have to look hard at is how we use polypropylene and polyethylene in the array. Do we need it? Is there, are there fire retardant substitutes? Can we do with less? but we need to do that evaluation, the technical evaluation of a, uh, something happening within the array. The radiological and chemical analysis were very, very similar to the technical assessment team. Uh, we looked at all the information, we looked at it independently. Uh, the drum 68660, at least looking at the radiological analysis, has a distinctive nucleide mixture. It's a combination of material types, and these are from defense program types. And this is the only drum within the array that has all three of those weapon program types in there. So it's a, it's a exact signature of at least that 68660 breach. No other drums in array seven has all three of those elements in there. Now, you, you can't definitively rule out, and I think we say that in our report, and I think, and Tad does as well as in their report, a very, very minor, and I could add a bunch of varies onto that statement, uh, contribution from other sympathetic drums as a result of the heating process. But we didn't see any evidence of that. And we got the camera wherever, where all the places we needed to look at the locking rings and look at, at places where the spray would happen. We didn't see any evidence of that. But you can't rule it out scientifically. Uh, and the chemistry that was, I won't go into that, that was, uh, you know, uh, um, consistent with, with uh, you know, the things that we saw based on all the chem uh, chemical samples as well as radiological samples taken. 
Let me leave a little time. I think we left a little bit of time for questions. I, I, I can take those here as well as online. And um, go. We'll go ahead and start with the audience questions uh, like we normally do. Thanks, Ted. Um, since this is a special town hall and since we have the, uh, such a high level of expertise with us, we'd like to suggest that everybody focus their questions. Uh, for the panel that we have available and also for the folks that are online um, uh, We'd like to also suggest you get your questions in early. Don't wait till the last minutes. So get your questions in the queue and uh, With that we're ready to start okay. um, I don't think I, I had it chance only to glance through the report, of course, since it just came out a few uh, hours ago. But um, just like the first report on the fire, I think this report is deficient. Uh, let me tell you why. I think what you did was basically investigate this as um, an event. Let, let me come up with an analogy. Um, if somebody in the Catholic Church or in the... Um, I think you did not ask the question, why did they fail to understand whatever they didn't understand at either Los Alamos or here at WIP? And why did they fail to implement? You just say they failed to understand, they failed to implement. And let me offer you something. Because uh, I believe that since on your board there was no mining expert, it was because I think you failed to understand the conflict between the nuclear and the mining safety culture. At WIP, and I think at Los Alamos as well, nuclear safety overrides everything else, or so-called nuclear safety. And we already know that nuclear safety actually, or a, a preoccupation with nuclear safety, or a wrong um, prioritization of nuclear safety caused the fire underground to be to have worse effects than it would have otherwise had because the operator down here actually used a nuclear safety mitigation measure reduced ventilation or filtered ventilation in order to mitigate mistakenly the effects of a mine emergency a fire so i think everyone there was focusing on nuclear safety and they said basically assumed that what's good for dealing with the consequences of nuclear emergency must also somehow be helpful to mitigate the fire. Uh, I believe the same thing happened here with a radiological event. And that is, we are not dealing really with a nuclear ro root cause, we're dealing with a chemical uh, root cause. We have incompatible chemicals down there. So we had a preoccupation at both Los Alamos and at WIP with nuclear issues. And people missed the risk that was caused by overlooking some chemical incompatibility. And I don't think that either one of your reports actually goes there. Now, when we had the um, technical assessment team people here, they repeated several times that they were not leaving their lane that had been actually preordained for them to do their investigation in. So I looked in your charter and I did not see any such lane. So I think you could have dug deeper. So the question that I have is, why didn't you? Thank you for the question. Now let me try to address some of those. And, uh, and hopefully I have a chance to read the report in a little bit more detail. Uh, and uh, then we can talk you know, next week as well. Uh, first of all, you have to read two bo uh, reports both together. The phase one and phase two, and if you did, then you would recognize that we had Mine Safety and Health Organization Administration as a advisor to phase one, and they were definitely you know helping us. And we spent a lot of time in phase one talking about the mine versus the nuclear safety component. That was a big piece of phase one, us, uh, and we had tons of conclusions and judgment of needs addressing that very same thing. Um, about the conclusions, you're right, and, and when you give a brief like this, you talk about the failure of that, the failure of this, uh, and, and you have to look at the analysis and the conclusions behind that, and, and, I, and I think that's in, that's in the substance of the text 
in the chapters, in the report, and then we develop those failure conclusions based on the analysis. So I think a lot more of that will be captured uh, or, you know, as, as you go through it. Uh, also, I, you know, we started off, we weren't in any lanes. We were looking at the event, and we, we started with a bunch of hypotheses. I think we probably had a you know, good dozen hypotheses that we were working through. So we did not focus uh, you know, on you know, a breach drum, a minnow to waste stream. We, you know, we looked at all these hypotheses, and, and we run them to ground you know, in a document of different initiators of different things that might have happened. Um, so, you know, so yeah, yeah, it's, you know, I think uh, yeah, I appreciate your comments, uh, you know, and, and um, you, know, may, you know, maybe we'll discuss it further, uh, you know, as, as, as you get some specific, as we get specific details uh, on your thoughts on it. So what I would add, as a member of the technical assessment team, but also somebody who's been in nuclear chemical operations for almost 30 years, is a nuclear safety assessment does consider more than just nuclear safety. If you're defining nuclear safety as criticality and things like that associated with it, it does assume, it does go into accident analyses and, and, and consequences from chemical events particularly when you're dealing with a chemical process. That's all part of the assessment. So when we talk about a nuclear safety assessment, in a reactor system, yeah, you're dealing with nuclear criticality and things like that. In a chemical process system, it is way beyond just what somebody would characterize as a nuclear mindset. You're looking at chemical phenomena. And in fact, in a lot of the facilities I've been associated with, the, the chemical consequences, the consequences for chemical far exceed the consequences associated with the radiological component. So it is all part of the one, the same assessment. Yeah, and in both phases, especially in phase one, where we looked at you know breakdowns in the maintenance and the radiological protection, emergency response, uh, and the system elements, you know, we tried to drill down on those whys. Why did they break down? And then, you know, which led to general conclusions and judgment of needs. Related to a lack of training in some cases. Absolutely. Any other in-house questions? Mary. I have to say that I think this investigation was a failure because you failed to assign blame, just the opposite of what you told us, that you couldn't assign blame. And uh, this is rampart and government everywhere. So uh, someone needs to be blamed. Uh, someone needs to be penalized, and that's what should happen, and we can't blame everyone and no one. Yeah, good comment, Mary. Um, you know, and, and we need to look at that, but more importantly, uh, we lose a lot from this, from an event like this. Uh, first, we were lucky there were no injuries, no deaths. We were blessed in that respect. So if we don't use this opportunity, and I think the Secretary said it well when we briefed him, is that you know, this is where everybody ought to look at their respective organizations, no matter what you're doing, uh, based on the lessons learned from this report and the breakdown of systems, programs, processes, hazard controls, and uh, in, in, in learn and in, in improve as an organization. So if we went the blame route, we would lose that potential and ability to use this as a real lessons learned tool. And that's what the accident investigations are designed to do, to, you know, you had focused on one location, but they're meant for the complex as a whole to learn from it. All right, Norbert. After attending several of these meetings and also the mayor's nuclear task force meetings and bringing up this subject, I was sort of looking forward to this report in finally finding in there maybe something about the actual risk that these accidents caused. And as part of that risk, I was looking forward to maybe finally see in this report also first a map with contour lines of what is what was the actual exposure underground and on the surface. The report does not have any of those. Instead, it has the mine map 
with the different colors and it says one has so many DPM up to so many, or DAC or whatever it is on there. And I compare that to having a contour map here of the Guadalupe Mountains that range up to 8,500 feet or thereabouts. And then I found one contour line that does not say 7,000 feet and the next one says 7,500 feet or 7,100 feet. But I have different colors on a topographic map and it says over here it's somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 feet and over there it's somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 feet. It's sort of ridiculous, of course, but that's the only, that, that's the information that is still missing. Is anyone going to follow up with this and actually publish something on an authoritative basis, a ba basis on the real risk and on the real exposure and the contamination that was generated as a result of these accidents? Well, I know you, and I've been in a, heard enough town meetings where that's been asked and answer and addressed. It's been asked a lot, and I know, uh, you know, that they do have radiological maps and survey maps, you know, established. And yes, part of risk is the, in the analysis of, you know, everything we need to do in terms of, you know, how we package and, you know, in in, in the efforts that, you know, in the efforts done, you know, that, that risk has to be you know, established in that, but. Yeah, we, we don't address it that uh, significantly in the report, the risk from it. Okay. I, I think we're going to go to the Internet now, see okay. if we have some. Uh, thank you. And if you wouldn't mind, if anybody other than Mr. Weika answers, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself when you, you take the mic, just because we've been looking at you the whole time online. So just to, just to clarify there, please. Uh, first question, the report mentions interviews, 2,000 pages of transcriptions and other sources that are not listed in the references. Will these sources and information not listed as references be publicly released? It, it's all FOIA-able information, the transcript information. Okay. It won't be posted as reference documents, though. Okay. The, the transcripts. Uh, question number two Why does the report not include contamination data from underground sampling in areas outside of Panel 7 and CAM 151? And that's the same as sort of Norwood's question. We didn't need that to draw conclusions and judgment needs for the report. We know that data is available. Uh, NWP has that information. We have survey maps. I, I have a ton of survey maps, but it wasn't needed for this report. And that sort of answers your question, Norbert, too. That's why we didn't, you know, we didn't address that material, because we didn't need it to, for our conclusions. Okay. Um, just one second, please. Since there were so many failures, why weren't these failures identified before the incident? That's a, that's a good question, and you know, that's part of what we learned in the, the oversight activities. And I think we need to take a look at, at all layers of oversight, you know, starting with the contractor assurance system, the federal oversight, as well as headquarters oversight on why some of these elements were missed. Okay, um, so you don't you don't you don't have to look at me when you're answering because <laughs> it's, it's, um, I, I pre okay. Uh, question number four: Is your consensus the same as the technical assessment team that you cannot determine with absolute certainty the cause due to the limitations and constraints, including access to the drum? It was not possible to form an exact inventory of the drum, and details of the remediation for drum were not documented. Uh, that's correct. Uh, you know, we like the TAT, and I'll let the TAT speak for themselves. Uh, you can't define the exact exothermic reaction, exactly what happened. We know it was an exothermic reaction, all the indicators pointed at. Uh, and with regard to the forensics on the drum, you know, there was uh, discussions early on what to go get the drum, to, you know, to you know, interrogate the drum physically. And, and I'd ventured at the Uncertainties of the mechanical agitation of actually going and getting the drum would probably, you know, make the our conclusions probably even less in terms of what we got from the visual surveillance. So I think we got more from the visual surveillance on the on the reaction on the exothermic reaction that took place than we would have if we actually physically went and got the drum. But I'll let David or John also speak to that. If they wish. David Wilson from. 
Savannah River National Laboratory. Uh, I would agree with Ted's assessment. I think that we, um, you know, we, we faced a lot of uncertainty in, in our analysis, uh, un uncertainty from uh, gaps in historical records that Ted's referred to, um, you know, difficulty in getting samples from the room it left us with some limited analytical samples. Um, thank you. We all have that problem today, I think, and I <laughs> tend to talk softly anyway. Um, but in, at, at the end of the day, we were able to make some, I think, fairly definitive conclusions based on, on our analyses. And we were able to demonstrate oxidation of materials uh, within the drum. We were able to demonstrate that there were, it was clearly an exothermic uh, reaction. We were able to model the, the mechanical behavior of the drum and characterize the energetics. Uh, the folks at Sandia did, did a very fine job of that and characterized the reaction in their terms as a slow thermal runaway and slow is a relative term for, for them. Uh, slow to me is fast. Uh, their slow is fast for me. Um, but so we, we were able to characterize the, uh, the chemical and, and physical behaviors in the drum uh, to the point that we were able to, to conclude that we had an, a, a series of chemically incompatible materials uh, they, within that drum, the, the conditions were such that the, uh, um, there were a series of, of internal exothermic re reactions that led to internal heating, and, and that that heating uh, or the temperature in the drum reached a point that it supported the thermal runaway. Uh, now, there are some questions that, that remain about the extent to which the materials in the drum um, might have burned, if you will, after the, the runaway stopped or quenched. Um, but I don't think that, that knowing, you know, having a look into the drum and assessing that would, would change our conclusions. I would only add that all of the evidence that we did find supported the conclusion that we ultimately came to with, with, with a high degree of confidence. The, the known things about the organic-based um, absorbent itself the inherent nature of the nitrate salt matrix and the and the three liquids that were absorbed all had characteristics that suggested that this type of a reaction could occur. And there weren't any outliers as far as I could tell in our evidence gathering. Thanks, Roger. We gotta keep as close to these mics as we can. I think got, Norbert uh, has another question. Norbert, you have another question? We need to get the lapel mic. Sure. Just a very simple technical uh, or editorial question. On your diagram up there, east is uh, on the right, is that correct? You're talking about this diagram? Yeah. There? Yes, sir, uh, Norbert, that, the red is the sort of the nearest the face. Where so that is actually west. Yeah, that correct? would be west. Yeah, that would be good in the report if you had that actually indicated on these diagrams on uh, you know, figure two, four, for example, and then also figure six, two. Um, the, uh, the other question is, um, actually, you had in one of your, con in the list of the contributing causes that you showed earlier, you had one item was nuclear safety. And so I looked in the, um, in, the, in my page that I copied from the report this afternoon, I looked for that item, nuclear safety, and I didn't see it there, and I don't think, I may have missed it, but I don't think you went into that. Could you be specific as to what exactly you mean with that? Because, you know, I just made the point that I think a preoccupation or primacy of nuclear safety actually endangered people at WIP in other respects, in the mining respect. So. Uh, would you mind uh, maybe elaborating on what exactly was the deficiency of the c contributing cause in nuclear safety? Thanks, thanks, Norbert. And there's actually a whole section on uh, nuclear safety. It's chapter seven in the report. Uh, and the two focus areas were pretty much the USQ process, the unreviewed safety question process, and the adequacy of the process, and the depth of getting the right reviews at the right time, uh, you know, on, on, the, on the processes. Uh, there was a case in which one revision was reviewed and they used that same information from revision 26 
through other revisions, so they didn't do a uh, new uh, sort of an extensive USQ review on the different changes. Right, right. So, and it's also on the uh, BIOS on the basis for interim operations, but there's actually about, you know, extensive chapter on the nuclear safety piece on it. Atlanta. Yeah, there's two, yeah. two conclusions and six judgments of need related to nuclear safety. Okay, let's go back to the internet. Uh, here's a couple questions that were kind of paired together. How many drums that still remain at the surface sites may be impacted by the multitude of chemical failures that are listed in the AIB report? Uh, similar question, does the AIB report address the possibilities of similar chemical reactivity in the scores of drums that remain on the surface? Well, we talk about in our conclusion or, you know, the direct cause, and that in itself, you know, there's several drums that are, you know, potentially similar type uh, mixtures, and, and those are being analyzed and assessed and monitored, you know, at Los Alamos, and they are undergoing reactions. You know, they're, they're drums that they're looking at. Uh, many of them are, you're seeing some oxidation, you're seeing increases in CO2, H, hydrogen, as well as N2O. Not at the same level, not at the same pace as we saw, obviously, in this drum. You know, if you call if this drum reacted within 72 days. That's not atypical for, you know, this type of reaction, you know, especially in the, in the hay industry, you know, most, you know, you get those type of reactions uh, uh, with, a, you know, a organic and neutralizing agent, and it's usually within a 60-day time frame. This has been uh, now going on 13 months, but yes, all those drums, and some of it's just normal oxidation, but some of it may be, you know, at a, at a different rate than others. So every drum's unique, uh, and it's based on where, you know, how much absorbance added, the amount of neutralizing agents, how the stuff is packaged, you know, the compatible mater uh, the materials and, and the different reactions going in. And I'll let John get into a little bit more detail. But again, I'll go again. Uh, John Mara from Savannah River National Lab. To, to answer the specific questions, the only surface stored drums uh, that contain the same type of mixture are being stored at Los Alamos. And they're all in double containment isolation. They're being monitored daily. They're in a HEPA filtered building and Los Alamos is developing a, uh, you know, remediation plan for those. Now, as Ted said, you know, these types of reactions are, are notoriously difficult to predict. And while Los Alamos has been seeing and they're monitoring the headspace gas, the headspace gas does give some indication that there are reactions occurring. There's also been a downturn in the generation of headspace gas over the past several months, which would suggest that the reaction, if it is occurring, is either slowing down or passivating itself, is, is the way we refer to it in the, the, the chemistry, chemistry world, is that it, it's, it's reached a steady state and it's stopped. But again, Los Alamos is going to have to consider those hazards as they do the remediation. Okay, um, I'll, I'll ask this and, and how you want to answer this given your role as investigators may be slightly different. It's a question that has been asked at prior meetings, but uh, your investigation report states that the workers were required to, to wear double PPS. Uh, the question is, how often are they examined by a, a radiational contamination doctor? Um, I suppose from your point of view, it, did, did your investigation address the issue of, of doctor visits? We did not address it, but, but I lived that dream because I'm in that monitoring program as well. Uh, and it's once a quarter you go through bioassay analysis. Uh, there's no doctor requirement visits, but they do monitor you uh, through bioassay analysis on a quarterly basis. Anybody that wears a respirator in the underground, you're doing that type of work. Uh, based upon the failures identified in the reports, have other generating sites initiated a lessons learned review of procedures, practices, and safety culture? That's a great question, and that goes back to Mary's question, to uh, my response to Mary's question. And it, uh, and that's where we need to go. Uh, they, they are. They are. They're, they're learning from this. They learned from the first two reports, and you know, this is a report for not just uh, WIP and uh, Los Alamos. It's a report for you know every site in a complex to look at their activities. And it's not whether you're just dealing with drums. You can be. It could be a 
dealing with tanks, security issues, whatever you do as, a, as an organization in terms of operations, you need to look at the breakdown and programs, processes, systems, hazard analysis, uh, controls, and, and the oversight pieces uh, you know, to self-improve your programs, whatever it is. Okay, this is one of, you, 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 there's been a back and forth on terminology and, and the, the question was, um, in both the AIB's opinion and the, and the TAT's opinion, did the breach of drum involve a quote unquote blast? Uh, I'll go first and then I'll, well, I'll let John go first this time. Okay, again, John Mara from Savannah River. The, uh, the modeling that the technical assessment team did specifically looked at the uh, the energetics of the reaction and the the, uh, the the chemical components that would lead to energetics. There is no evidence in either the modeling or I would argue in the visual observation of anything that would resemble a detonation or a blast. This was an overpressurization and a, and a release uh, that occurred. You can tell by the positions of the, as Ted pointed out, the the MGO that was in there is largely undisturbed other than the polypropylene bags. Uh, the MGO super sacks uh, lost integrity, but there are no drums that are turned over. There's no evidence of, of any movement of any drum. So that would lead you to conclude in conjunction with the modeling that we did that this was not anything that you would characterize as a blast or a detonation. Yeah. Just to put it you know, as a sort of analogy, it's like those sand castles on a, on a beach, you know, the, uh, the MGO bags uh, 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 piles were perfect shape and, and the angle of repos, you know, you, there, was, uh, there really wasn't any sort of pressure or detonation, you know, those are perfectly shaped as squares above the standard waste boxes and cone shapes above the uh, drum packages. Uh, there was a question uh, as a, a follow-up to uh, the other similar drums. Um, why did you not mention the other similar drums at waste control specialists? I think we talked about those in the report. Uh, you know, those are drums that we looked at, uh, not physically, but in terms of the information we can get from those drums uh, to look if there were, you know, how close they sort of replicated, you know, the subject drum that we were looking at in terms of free liquid, in terms of pH, but obviously we can't get to those, but, you know, there are, you know, other minnow two drums, and we looked, uh, we looked at the RTRs on all of them. I have a question for the, uh, the technical assistant uh, team to do with headspace. Um, headspace sampling is expected to remain a requirement for a statistical portion of the waste sent to WIP, which is very ambiguous, statistical proportion. I don't know what that means. You know, one, three, five hundred. But could that have stopped this uh, reaction if they had tested that headspace and found the gas that was. And one more question about um, vents. Did there have been another vent on that canister? I mean, the vents are supposed to stop, you know, expansion of gases. So those are those are good questions. Uh, the the Headspace gas measurements that are taking, taken for the WIP waste acceptance criteria, uh, you know, has been a long-standing process. It is unlikely that those would have caught any type of reaction because what typically happens is this, in these types of what are what are termed thermal runaways or cook-off reactions, is things move very slowly, and then when they hit a, a break point, they move very quickly. And you'd have to catch it at the right time to be able to determine that you were cutting close to that break point if you knew everything about the mechanistics of the reaction. So that's the, the second portion. Um, now, you know, every drum in WIP is vented. And they're all vented for a reason because gases are generated primarily by radiolysis. Uh, radiolysis occurs with the, you know, any type of residual surface moisture that's there as well as uh, any components. Now the, the, the rate of radiolysis, we, we call it G value, the rate at which that radiolysis occurred. The, the G value rates are very, very low 
in true waste. It is not something because of the level of radioactivity and the level you just don't see high level. So the vents are designed for radiolysis. The, zent, the vents are not designed to, to handle this type of reaction that occurred. So a secondary vent in there may or may not have helped you, but at the time that these, these thermal runaway reactions occur, when you hit that break point, you are generating copious quantities of gas over a very short period of time. So the, the vent system uh, would have to be relatively large. And because you're trying to contain radioactive particles, you don't want a relatively large ventilation system. So you're going through that kind of trade. But there's, it's a good question, but it's unlikely that that would have been able to uh, determine or or give you some indication that this type of reaction is occurring. And, and this drum actually had a flammable gas analysis performed on it. This drum had a flammable gas analysis performed on it as part of the characterization process to meet the TRAMPAC requirements for shipment. So. All right. I understand all the members of the AIB that signed the report are EM employees, correct? That, that or DOE correct. employees? All DOE, DOE in, okay. by the order they're supposed to be. Right, right, right. Um, sort of emphasizing again the point that I believe that the non-nuclear safety was ignored and that that actually was the major reason for both of these accidents who happened because they were chemically incompatible. They were based on chemically incompatible materials. Um, there are some other geologic repositories in the world, not for true waste, but for low inter intermediate level waste. I don't know if any one of those repositories had ever had anything like this happen. However, there are some repositories in salt for non-radioactive, which is a stupid word because everything is radioactive, but for chemically toxic waste. And several of those repositories have had fires as a result of chemical incompatibilities. There were several minor fires in one German underground repository in a still operating potash mine. And there was a major and significant one in a French potash mine that was converted into a hazardous waste repository. They actually had to decommission that repository. So again, we tend to focus as soon as something nuclear and radioactive comes up on the nuclear and radioactive aspect. So we are looking at other at repositories in other countries, and I have seen it in my years at WIP, and I still continue to see it. When people from DOE or contractors go and look at other repositories, they focus with a laser focus on radioactive waste repositories. And they never really ask very much about repositories for other stuff. I think if there had been a somewhat broader focus rather than this laser-like focus on nuclear safety, they might have known that before and might have paid more attention on chemical incompatibility. They might have given that a higher priority. And this might not have happened here. So I know that the international effort of DOE is always um, sort of the stepchild, okay? And the, it's sort of being defunded and then funded again, defunded and reduced and increased. Um, that is one area where lessons learned could be really usefully applied to our program, broaden our horizon, uh, not just going international beyond just our domestic stuff here, but also broaden it and truly um, keep in mind that this is mixed waste. It isn't just radioactive waste. No need. Good statement. So, so again, I'll, I'll comment. And when you talk about nuclear safety, and, and my experience with nuclear process upsets, and I've been associated and, and investigated a number of them, is it's the, the nuclear component to the safety evaluation typically drives the consequence. It doesn't drive the accident unless you get a criticality. So when you're, when you're looking at chemical processing of nuclear materials, you are by definition primarily analyzing 
chemical hazards. That's why companies like DuPont started the Savannah River site, because it was a chemical process that just happened to be working with nuclear materials. So when you go through these uh, USQ evaluations and design authority technical reviews that you do on these, you are looking at the nuclear component primarily as a consequence of, a comp of an accident that occurs because of, of a, if it's a chemical processing plant, a chemical processing plant. So, you know, I, I, I do understand what you're saying, but I think the system that's set up focuses on the, on the broad aspects of processing where the nuclear, the, the difference is the nuclear drives the consequence, and it can drive the consequence uh, in a number of different ways. But as I mentioned earlier, a number of the facilities that I've worked in, particularly when you're dealing with, with hazard to the co-located worker, it's primarily a chemical hazard than it is a, a nuclear hazard. So we do look at that entire system. The system that DOE has and all their nuclear safety orders are not just focused on nuclear issues. They're focused on the broad process that just happens to involve nuclear materials. OK, we're going to take one more from the internet, and then I think we're going to wrap up. OK, and again, I did get a few other questions that are probably appropriate for our, our next general meeting, and I'll, I'll take care of those then. Um, is there any of it evidence that a secondary gas combustion reaction took place after the searing hot gas gases erupted from the internal runaway radiation reaction? Excuse me. No, this was based on the visual evidence, and again, we did a lot extensively. We, you know, with both the uh, uh, dome camera as well as the dipping camera, got into all the locations that we needed to get into, and we did not see any any evidence of any secondary reactions. And we looked at the uh, the locking rings and the seal containers and ensured the integrity was there, as well as on the adjacent packages to all those locking rings to make sure there wasn't any evidence of spray. So there was absolutely, based on a comprehensive visual survey, no indication of any secondary uh, drum reactions. All right. I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. I want to remind uh, particularly the online uh, viewers that uh, the, the slides, TED slides tonight, are posted on our website. And uh, with that, we'll turn it back over to Joe. Again, thank you all for uh, being here tonight and uh, those on the web for asking the questions and uh, thank you all for uh, participating and being here for the, this community uh, today. Uh, I do want to mention that, uh, you know, we'll be following the process. We'll be writing the corrective action plans that are tied back to the uh, report. So we'll be following that process, the normal process that we've been uh, following all along. And then also that, uh, again, as Ted mentioned, they're going to be up in Los Alamos next week, a uh, week from today. And we'll have information on our website. Uh, I think they're going to be live streaming also, so you'll be able to uh, get online also. Uh, so if you have questions, then uh, you'll be able to ask those also. And so that'll be, all that information will be on our website uh, if you go on there and, and provide that. Again, thank you, and uh, you have a good night.